Tick tock, time to rock. David Wood and Tony Costa kicking it live with the squeaky flow here on W O O D Radio Live. How you doing, Tony? I'm doing great, Dave. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Let me uh, check. All right, I see ourselves, so we are on officially. How are we sounding, everyone? Well, let me check my mic. I habitually do not click my correct mic, and so it just picks up the computer. Nope, that is my correct mic. I think we are good. Excellent. All right, how's everyone doing? I uh, see we got Andrew Martin, Stephen Atkins, Bartimaeus, Ergo Sum, Mick Brazel, <laughs> Berger Johansson. Where? Where is Diva Love Girl? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to keep us entertained tonight? <laughs> no, we love you, Diva Love Girl. We, uh, we thank you for the opportunity. For uh, We thank you that the Almighty is using you to expose Islam, to help us expose Islam. <laughs> All right, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, we see the topic there. Uh, Muhammad, history's greatest plagiarist, but the idea is that Muhammad was a plagiarist. So that's what we're going to talk about right now, and we have one of the best people in the world to discuss it. Um, he's been called the David Wood of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> which means that he's also a much nicer version uh, and says A at the end of everything. That's right, eh? And eats, uh, what do you guys eat? Maple syrup or something up there? Yeah, yeah and uh, back bacon, Canadian back bacon. What is that? It's it's basically bacon from the back of the pork instead oh. of the, the belly. Oh. I mean, the, the most common bacon is the belly, uh, belly bacon that we usually associate with our breakfast. But uh, the back bacon is a lot more leaner. So what, you, what 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 is it that you guys that that we call like ham or something and you call bacon or you, we call bacon and you call ham or what is that? Do you know what I'm well, talking I'm not about? Sure, I think. Uh, I think. I mean, I know that uh, we call we the, your Salisbury steak is a hamburger, and uh, the wieners are a hot dog. So uh, I, I'm not sure about the the ham there, uh, David. So not sure about. So when you order breakfast in a diner in in the U.S., you don't notice yeah. any tremendous difference when you order some nope. some product. Nope. Okay, that's interesting. No, nope. pretty much the same. Pretty much the same. Um, all right. Well, that sounds good. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we are going to be talking about plagiarism, and just to tell you why this might be important, uh, Tony. Lots of people come along, and especially if you're Muhammad, especially if you're Muhammad, and you're claiming to be in line with earlier revelations and so on, we, we would expect we would expect uh, to see a lot of similarities in the stories you're telling with the people who came before you. So why would why would uh, this plagiarism be uh, a terrible concern to us? And 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 uh, someone already brought up earlier before we went live. I saw it in the chat. Um, uh, you know, it, it, are, are we applying a modern standard when we talk about plagiarism? Are we applying a modern standard that would have been uh, foreign to someone like Muhammad? Mm -hmm. Well, even the question of whether plagiarism is is uh, uh, an apt term to use here or whether it's something that we're using anachronistically, it, that's a completely irrelevant question. Uh, the issue here, David, is that the Quran claims that all of its contents are heavenly in origin. Mm -hmm. That is to say, the Quran itself has no human source whatsoever. And so the main issue here is the very idea that Muhammad got something from his present day experience or he, he got a story from someone else and put it into the Quran violates the very statements of the Quran. So it's not a matter of whether or not plagiarism in the 21st century applies in the 7th century in the same way. But the point here is that the Quran clearly claims that its contents are not from an earthly source. They are heavenly. They are written on the mother of the book, the Umar Kitab, and then they have been sent down to Muhammad. And so the Quran, I think, actually implodes on itself because the Quran implies that um, the contents that it has are not from any known sources, human sources. They don't come from Jewish, Christian, or other pagan Arab sources, they all come down from Allah. And that's why 
Uh, there are a couple of passages here in the Quran I think we have to look at. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, people will point out, hey, you know, they, they didn't have the same kind of concepts of, of plagiarism that, that we have, so they wouldn't have had a, a pr much of a problem with with copying. But, yeah, that, that kind of that kind of assumes the problem that Muhammad is supposedly, he's not yeah. supposed to be copying. He's not, not supposed to be copying right. at all. This stuff is supposed to be coming down exactly. from, from heaven. Um, and then yep. uh, additionally, we have to point out, they did have a pretty good understanding of what it was like for one person to copy something and then pass him off, uh, pass those things off as his revelations. Because mm -hmm. even in the Quran, Muhammad over and over again, like a beating drum, is accused of copying the tales of the ancients. He deliver revelations right. and they say, we've heard this all before. What are you talking about? We've heard right. this. We've heard this. We've heard this. And and uh, as you brought up, um, if the if the Quran is supposedly just revealed from heaven and Muhammad's not supposed to be getting this stuff from just the area around him, we have to wonder why pretty much everything he says can be traced to someone right around him. If it's really just coming down from heaven, he Precisely. should have, he should have all sorts of all sorts of additional knowledge that wouldn't have been available to these people at the time. In other Correct. words, he could have been talking about, uh, you know, he could have been talking about, you know, Asia and the Americas or whatever. Given the given the idea, it could have come with all sorts of stuff, and it, the information that Allah did come down with directly from heaven filling people in right to to expel their ignorance just happens to be a bunch of stuff that made people go ah oh, we've already heard that a thousand times what are you talking about exactly exactly so so here's the point david throughout the quran the quran uses this verb uh, in arabic tanzil which means to be sent down uh, the, the quran has been sent down mm -hmm. and over and over again you'll notice it says you cannot imitate one surah in the Quran. You can't even imitate one ayah in the Quran. All of it has been sent down. And in fact, it was preserved in the in the heavenly tablet, according to Surah 85 and verse 21. But here's the thing, David, I, th I think that the Quran itself is aware, uh, or at least the author or authors of the Quran are aware of this charge. And so in Surah 25 of the Quran, which you, which you mentioned, interestingly enough, that surah is called Al-Furqan which means the criterion. Mm -hmm. And I find it quite interesting that that, that passage, is, that surah is called the criterion. So I'm going to read verses four to six. This is from Yusuf Ali's translation. But the misbelievers say, not is this but a lie which he has forged, and others have helped them at it. In truth, it is they who have put forward in iniquity and falsehood. And they say, tales of the ancients which he has caused to be written, and they are dictated before him morning and evening. And then the response Muhammad is supposed to say is in verse 6. The Quran says, uh, it says, the Quran was sent down. So in the Arabic says, Kul uh, anzalahu, say it was sent down by him who knows the mystery that is in the heavens and the earth. The earth. Verily, he is off forgiving, most merciful. So notice, uh, David, that here in the Quran, the unbelievers come to Muhammad and they say, look, this is nothing but a lie. You've forged this. These are tales of the ancients. We've heard all this before. You're not introducing anything new. But if you notice, the response that Muhammad is supposed to give is not to say, yeah, yeah, you know, I, we, we have all heard this before, but I've got this new insight mm -hmm. into these stories that you've misunderstood. The Quran rather says the answer that Muhammad and Muslims by extension are to give to this charge is no, it has been sent down by him who knows the mystery. So the moment, David, uh, a Muslim says, yeah, yeah, sure, that came from this source, so that came from that source. The moment they do that, they are in violation of the Quran, which tells them that the proper response to that charge is to say that Allah has sent it down. And then in Surah 68, verse 15, it continues, it says, when our revelations are recited unto him, Muhammad, he saith mere fables of men of old. And then again in Surah 16, verses 103 and 105, we know indeed that they say it is a man that teaches him. The tongue of him they wickedly point to is notably foreign, while this is pure, this is Arabic, pure and clear, which again is, is, uh, is uh, false. It is those who believe not in the signs of God that forge falsehood. It is that who lie. So notice that the Quran is well aware of these charges, mm -hmm. but the answer that the Quran gives is, no, these do not come from any human sources. They have been sent down. That's the word for revelation. The word tanzil means, it literally means to send down, but it is also translated in some English translations of the Quran as revealed. And as you know, David, you've been through this before. I've been through this before. 
when we look at the Quran, what we find is that, lo and behold, the charge of the unbelievers is actually true. And so, for example, the, the story of Cain and Abel, when, when Cain kills his brother Abel, and then he wonders what to do with the body, and then the Quran says that uh, in Surah 5, verse 31, a raven came and started scratching the ground, and thereby Cain learned how to bury his brother. Well, again, that was a very well-known story mm -hmm. in, in the Targum of Jonathan ben Uziah. And it was, it was very well known to the Jews of Arabia. Uh, they would have recounted these stories uh, in Medina, for example, where there was a high uh, number of, of, of Jewish people. So here we've got that story. Uh, the famous uh, passage in Surah 5, verse 32, where it says, uh, We ordain for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder, for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew see, that, the whole world. See, religion of peace. Exactly. That proves it. Exactly, yeah. And it's given to the Jews. But, of course, this passage was very well known in the Mishnah. It comes mm -hmm. from Sanhedrin 4, verse 5, where the, the Mishnah says that uh, it, it talks about the story of Cain and Abel. And then it goes on to say that uh, whoever kills a person, it's as if they could kill the whole world. Mm -hmm. We know where Muhammad got this from. The, the Jews of Medina had Talmuds. They studied the Talmud. And so there's another story in the Quran, which our Muslim friends assume they take it for granted that this thing actually happened when these are just really uh, what we call Haggagah. They're just ta uh, tales and fables that come from the Jewish sources. They're not canonical, by the way, or inspired. Um, just a couple more here. The story of Abraham uh, breaking the idols and being thrown in the fire by Nimrod. Mm -hmm. um, comes from the Midrash Rabbah. It comes from a Jewish source centuries before the Quran. Um, the idea that Nimrod did this is 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 a sign of a, that the text is apocryphal, isn't it? Because Nimrod lived long before Abraham mm -hmm. in the book of Genesis, chapter 11, with the construction of the Tower of Babel. Muhammad has no sense of time here. Everything is just jumbled together. It's all happening at the same time. Uh, the story of Solomon and Sheba in Surah 27 where, uh, where she, uh, Queen of Sheba comes to the palace of Solomon and she thinks that the palatial ground is a pool of water because it's so clear. Mm -hmm. uh, that comes from the, uh, the Targum of Esther. Uh, and then, of course, God raising the Mount Sinai over the heads of the Jews and threatened to kill them. That comes from the Avodah Zara. Um, the story of the golden calf, which jumped out of the fire and mood It actually lowed. Mm -hmm in Surah 7, and that it was constructed by a Samari, or by a Samaritan. Um, this story, once again, is very well known. It comes from the Perky of Rabbi Eliezer. Um, the seven heavens, we hear about Allah being called the Lord of the seven heavens. You could find reference to that in the Jewish Haggagah. You could also find it in the Zohar. The Zohar itself makes mention of the seven worlds. The angels being commanded to worship Adam, bow down and worship him. Uh, Christians knew this. They comes from a source called the life of Adam and Eve. Um, and on and on it goes, the seven sleepers in Sur 18, where uh, the seven sleepers go, go to sleep and they wake up centuries later. Uh, we know this. This was Gregory of Tours. He actually wrote a legend called the seven sleepers of Ephesus. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary being raised and dedicated in the temple. One of the courses I teach, David, at the Toronto Baptist Seminary, I teach a course on biblical reliability. And uh, we also do a study on the Apocrypha, on the Old Testament Apocrypha and the New Testament Apocrypha. And I have my students read the Protevangelium of James. And lo and behold, in that story, you have the story of Mary being brought to the temple and dedicated to the temple, to the work of God, like Samuel was in the Old Testament. And she's raised in the temple and angels come and feed her. Uh, and lo and behold, the Quran says the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus speaking from the cradle. This was a... This is uh, found in the infancy gospel of Thomas. Uh, Mary given birth under a palm tree, which is like it's like uh, Christmas in Hawaii there in uh, Surah 19. Um, we know, know where that comes from. It comes from the, the, uh, the uh, pseudo gospel of Matthew, exactly with the palm tree, with the, the rivet of water and the palm dates and the tree bending down. Uh, these are stories that many Christians in Arabia would have been familiar with. And so you can understand why, David, when Muhammad came along, along and started reciting these things the people were saying well, what's what's new with this muhammad we've heard all this before you're not introducing anything new and then the very concept of jana with the hoodies in, in in jana the 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 women in jana and drinking wine and so forth the persians in the in the persian sources you have stories of paradise the word paradise in fact comes from persia 
And they describe Persia, uh, the, the Persian paradise, as a place of women sexually serving men uh, and boys offering drinks on goblets and so forth and so on. And, and so a lot of this just demonstrates that the unbelievers, the, 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 the Kafir, were right when they came to Muhammad and said, hey, buddy, um, we've heard all this. This is nothing new. And so the unbelievers basically are calling his bluff. Mm -hmm. And the Quran acknowledges this charge. So, so here's the problem, uh, David. Whenever I debate various Muslim apologists and I bring this up, the first thing they do is they will uh, they will accede to the argument. They will say, yeah, you're right, Tony. Uh, you're absolutely right. We know where these sources come from, but they're still from God. Mm -hmm. The problem is the Quran says you're not supposed to say that. The Quran says you're supposed to say, no, you're the liars. You're the fabricators. This has been sent down by him who knows the secrets of the heavens. And therefore, the Muslim ends up violating the commands of the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, this, I think, to me, is the Achilles heel of the Quran. Mm -hmm. It is not what it claims to be. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, guys, so uh, if this is new information to you, if this is new information to you, um, we can think of a couple of uh, related problems here. Um, and I see a parallel between this and the Satanic Verses story. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. story of the Satanic Verses is that Muhammad was receiving a revelation. So a revelation is coming down to him. But then Satan gave him some verses. And Muhammad couldn't tell the difference. And so he delivered the verses that were from Satan as if they're part of the Quran. Then Gabriel has to come to him later and say, hey, those verses, those were actually from, from Satan. Um, so Muhammad had to come back and, and, uh, and repent of delivering these verses from the devil. But notice what's assumed there. Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God through the angel Gabriel and something that's invented by Satan himself. He couldn't tell the difference, right? And the parallel that, that I see here is there are prior scriptures that are affirmed in the Quran, the Torah, uh, the Gospel, the Psalms, and some sort of book of Abraham. You have these other books that are being affirmed as the divine word of God, according to the Quran. But Muhammad can't tell the difference between those and sources that come along much, much later, right? The, the sources that, that the Quran is using on the life of Jesus are coming from the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and even seventh century, beginning of the seventh century. They're coming from the, almost from the time of Muhammad himself. No historian on the planet takes these sources seriously. We know they're forgeries. Everyone knows they're forgeries except the author of the Quran. And so we kind of have two possibilities here. Uh, if Muhammad is the source of the Quran and he is an illiterate 7th century caravan robber, I understand Muhammad hearing the Jews talk about the Torah and hearing the Jews talk about their oral traditions or their commentaries and things like that and not knowing the difference between a story that comes from one and a story that comes from the other. I understand Muhammad not knowing the difference. He can't, just like he couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan, couldn't tell the difference between something that's from the Torah, something that's from some later Jewish source. He couldn't tell the difference between something that's actually from the gospel and something that comes from some later uh, fictitious Christian source. He couldn't tell the difference. I understand that. But when you tell me that the Quran is from God, now you're telling me that the author of the Quran could not tell the difference and that the author of the Quran is God, in which case God just doesn't know the difference between the sources he's quoting. He's ignorant. Um, he's certainly not all knowing. And what's going on here? What kind of God are you are you proclaiming? So that's kind of one massive insult. Now, the other the other sort of uh, related issue is what I what I just talked about in my video from yesterday. That notice it's it's sort of twofold what Muhammad is doing. He's taking all these stories from earlier sources. Can't tell the difference from where they're coming from. He doesn't care if it actually came from Moses or if it came from, you know, a century or two before his time. He just, he can't tell the difference. But at the same time, he's taking these sources, he's rewriting the stories so that they're Islamic and all the characters then sound like Muhammad. 
So if he's talking about Jesus, Jesus all of a sudden sounds like Muhammad. If he's talking about Abraham, all of a sudden Abraham sounds like Muhammad. Moses sounds like Muhammad. They all sound exactly like Muhammad when none of these guys sounded like Muhammad. All right. So those are a couple issues. All right. Uh, let's take a couple of quick questions. Uh, one, Tony, is uh, apparently there are some people who didn't see our other live stream. So Bucks asks, who is Tony Costa? Why don't you tell him who Tony Costa is? <clears throat> well, um, I'm a professor in, in Toronto, Canada, and uh, I teach at uh, several seminaries and I do some teaching with the University of Toronto as well. And I'm also a pastor of a church. I co-pastor a church with my uh, buddy, Pastor Soleil Prince, who's probably watching this as well. Um, and I've been an apologist uh, for about 35 years or so. Um, so that's pretty much, that's my history. I've been born in Canada, so I'm a, I'm a true Canuck. All right. Um, we, we have, uh, see, some, uh, a lot of awesome video ideas I have come out of my own head. <laughs> Other times they come from people doing requests. But here we have uh, QWERTY saying, when are you going to release a video on the top five plagiarized Quran stories with the dates and place where the story derived from? So uh, could even do that as a top 10, but that would require some sort of, that would require some thinking. You know what I mean? Uh, what, what would, what would, uh, if you were to make like a top five list, this is off the top of your head. You might, you might, you might need to yeah. need to think through it. But uh, what uh, what stories can you think of that would be on your top five list of uh, of uh, stories that are plagiarized from other other sources? Well, uh, I think some of the ones I've just enumerated. I think the story of Jesus speaking from the cradle, coming from the infancy gospel, uh, which I think dates to about the third century A.D. Um, the story of Mary being raised then in the temple and being fed by angels that's definitely second century the protevangelium of james is is one is 140 a.d or probably later um the the talmudic literature the talmud um come, comes around 250 a.d and so stories about uh, uh god raising up mount sinai over the heads of the jews that's third middle of the third century a.d um and i think the story of jesus also making clay birds breathing mm -hmm. on them and animating them. It's like a, a scene out of Snow White where the birds just fly off. Fly off. Uh, I think that's that's Infancy Gospel of Thomas. I think Protoevangelium of James, I think, I think says something to that effect as well. So basically the sources are, you're, the, the range of those sources, David, outside of the Quran, Quran are second century AD um, to about the, uh, the middle of the third century and end of the third century as well mm -hmm. um so the talmud you're looking at 250 years after jesus so yeah 250 a.d around there yeah uh yeah those would certainly be on uh, my list as well but uh i think if i if i put these together as like a top five list or top 10 list that uh yeah might be good because you can sort of uh you can pick them to sort of illustrates to sort of illustrate different points, right? The you know sure. if you get a couple from the Jewish sources, a couple from the Christian sources, and so on, then uh, yeah. And just so just so you just so you know, Tony, uh, it's um, on on YouTube. Lots of times, over and over again, we gotta we gotta give the the same information. It's about the packaging. Yeah. How do you package right. it? How do you get packaged? Right. How do you package it to get people to click on it? Hmm. Uh, yeah, David. Just an yeah. example of the infancy gospel of Thomas, mm -hmm. where. Jesus says, uh, well, the Quran says, he says, I am the slave of Allah mm. and and uh, I and that he's been and respectful to his mother and so forth. Well, in the infancy gospel of Thomas, it actually says, Jesus actually says, I am the son of God. Mm -hmm. That's he perfect. He claims to be the son of God. That's a, and that's so a... Muhammad, yeah, Muhammad hears that. But what he does is he changes the wording so that Jesus doesn't say, I am the son of God. He says, I am, I'm Abdullah. I'm the, the slave of Allah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, that, that's that's perfect. I, I, I'm wondering how many. Um, trying to think because that happens multiple times. Where once you know the source where Muhammad's getting it from, and then you look at the source and it's clearly calling Jesus the Son of God, and Muhammad uh, doesn't want to accept that, so he says he has Jesus say the exact opposite. I'm merely I'm right. a slave of of Allah, and then it, then those right. then those two issues kind of come together where he's taking the story, copying the story. But put, right. putting his Islamic twist on it and making yeah. it, making everyone sound like him. Yeah, and Jesus Jesus basically becomes a talking head, right? They all do. He's, Every, he's, everyone they're in the all Quran. talking head. Mm -hmm. 
for Muhammad. I don't know if you've ever read Tarif Khalidi, uh, his book, The Muslim Jesus. I'm not sure if you've read that, uh, uh, David. Yeah, I read. I know I read some of that. I've got it here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. He points this out. Let me quote him. This is from his book, The Muslim Jesus, published by Harvard University Press, 2001. He says this, the Quranic Jesus is in fact an argument addressed to his more wayward followers intended to convince the sincere and frighten the unrepentant. As such, now listen to this, this is a Muslim scholar, as such, he, that is Jesus, has little in common with the Jesus of the Gospels, canonical or apocryphal. And then he goes on to say on page 44 that the Islamic Jesus is, quote, a Muslim creation, an artificial creation. Mm -hmm. And then he says on page 45, the Muslim Jesus, the Islamic Jesus of the Muslim Gospels may be a fabrication and that he is meta-historical. That is to say, he has nothing in common with the historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. So he's basically a, an, an ad hoc figure. He's a contrived figure that, that Muhammad basically, as you rightly pointed out, Muhammad is the ventriloquist who's putting his words into the mouth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. To make it sound like Jesus was a Muslim, he went to the Kaaba, he ran around the Kaaba seven times, uh, he snorted water up and down his nose, you know, to, to uh, absolute ablution. Uh, so in other words, the Muslim Jesus is basically a, a Muslim creation. He has nothing. In fact, uh, my studies in New Testament, I did my doctorate in, in New Testament and theology. I don't know any New Testament scholar, liberal or conservative, that goes to the Quran to rediscover the historical Jesus. The only text they go to is the first century text, which is the New mm -hmm. Testament. Mm -hmm. And so it's very telling that when it comes to historical Jesus studies, no scholar ever appeals to the Quran for evidence for the historical Jesus, not one. Yeah, uh, yeah so Islam really is, uh say, seriously off in its historical, historical investigations. Um, yeah, big time. We, we, go, we go to first century sources Sources that are affirmed as the word of God by the Quran to get our information about right. Jesus. But Muslims say, don't go there. Don't go to those sources that are early and right. and that are affirmed as the word of God by the Quran. Why? Because they don't line up with the Quran. So right. where should we go to learn about Jesus? Well, you should go to the Quran um, to learn about Jesus, even though the Quran says that the affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of those first century sources, which we're telling you not to go to. Uh, and then if we want to learn about Muhammad, where do we go? Well, we go to sources that come two centuries after the time of Muhammad um, to learn about those, because that's where that's when, you know, the, the, the main Hadith collectors started uh, uh, putting their material together. And so it's just like how you could look at how Muslim scholars and apologists do history and it could be I mean it could be a course on how not to do history right it's like whatever right. whatever these guys are telling you about how you do history do the exact opposite because they're wrong they're wrong mm. about everything here mm -hmm. um, all right here's a uh, here's one you you you've already you've already touched you've already touched on this I don't know if Nani here um, wasn't paying attention or came in late but uh, Noni says they're all Abrahamic religion why call it plagiarism Christianity doesn't plagiarize from Judaism. Isn't it the same with Islam? So Christianity doesn't plagiarize from Judaism. Uh, no, uh, Christianity quotes earlier sources that were Jewish sources. But that's the point. It quotes, right? When Jesus is quoting the Torah, we know what he's quoting. When Paul quotes a prophet, we know what he's quoting. So that's very, very different from what's going on with Muhammad. What's what's Muhammad doing, uh, Tony? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, the claim that it's all Abrahamic, that's an equivoc that's equivocation. We're, we're not defining our terms properly. Um, Christianity is basically fulfilled Judaism. It is basically uh, the coming of the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, who was predicted in the Jewish scriptures. And as David rightly pointed out, the New Testament writers quote from those Jewish scriptures as the word of God. The problem with Muhammad is Muhammad comes 600 years later and he claims to have this consistent stream of revelation that started with Adam, who they believe was the first prophet, and goes straight through uh, the patriarchs, through the prophets, through Jesus, John the Baptist, the apostles, and it goes straight through to Muhammad. The only problem with that is that Muhammad's revelations directly contradict not just the Old Testament, but the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the New Testament is organically connected to the Old Testament. 
The Old Testament was the Bible of the early church, while the New Testament was in the process of being written, and we call this inscripturation, the process of Scripture being written. But the, the Old Testament Scriptures were organically connected. They were, they were not disjointed by a 600-year period where uh, a caravan a Arab in, in Saudi Arabia gets a revelation in a different tongue, uh, in a different area, and, and, and a revelation that, if you really look at it very deeply, um, is very much pre-Islamic. It, it, it contains pre-Islamic pillars like Ramadan, Zakat, the prayers, uh, and um, Salat, and, and, um, and, and the various pillars that, that Muslims today follow. Um, there's nothing new that Muhammad introduces. In fact, David, you, you mentioned earlier that Allah doesn't even know the difference between a canonical source and a non-canonical source. Well, Allah doesn't even know what Christians believe because mm -hmm. he, he, he really goofs up on the, on the Trinity. He assumes it's, it's Allah, Jesus, and Mary that are three gods. It assumes that Jesus is biologically the Son of God, that God generated sexually Jesus Christ through the Virgin Mary. So, so it's not only text, textually, the Quran is not only textually foreign to the Bible, it's theologically foreign. And, and that it doesn't even get the theology right. So you really have to ask yourself the question, didn't God at least know what Christians believed about the Trinity? Didn't God at least know? I can understand Muhammad not knowing, as you rightly pointed out, David. But when you look at not just the stories in the Quran and the claims, for example, that Muhammad makes that, that, uh, that the fall that took place in the Garden of Eden, which actually was not on the earth, the Quran says it was in paradise and they were sent down to the earth, um, the whole story gets rewritten right from the get-go. So there is no fall. Adam just goofed up. And then all of these people like Abel and Noah, all of these guys come along and they all talk like Muhammad. They mm -hmm. talk as if they all knew Muhammad. In fact, the Quran says that they knew about the coming of Muhammad and that Allah entered into a covenant with the prophets that they would support him when he came. So really, David, when you think about it, the Quran is really ad hoc. It's contrived right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the, just the, the the Jewish and Christian concepts of revelation are, are very different from the Islamic yes. concept of revelation, right? Um, when, when Luke decided to write a gospel, Luke sits down to write a gospel. We believe that he's, yeah. that he's, that he's guided by the Spirit and so on. Um, but it, we would have no problem with Luke quoting sources and things like that. If Luke had come out and said, every word that I'm writing right now is being delivered to me by an angel straight from heaven. I'm not getting this from anything around me. And, right. and then he proceeded to copy a bunch of stories that were all around him. Occasionally, some of them being reliable and others of, of them just complete fictions. And he's clearly copying. Then we'd, we'd have a different uh, we'd have a different sure. scenario. There. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, the uh, uh, <laughs> the Quran verse you read earlier, that one always cracks me up. Um, when the, uh, they accuse Muhammad of getting his information from this guy that he sits around talking with and Allah has to respond to this, right? Allah has to respond to this charge up. Oh, they say, they keep noticing that Muhammad's sitting down with this guy, the storyteller. And then Muhammad comes out the next day and he's like, I have a new revelation from the great God, Allah. And it's the same thing that guy was telling yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. And Allah gives his response and it's no, 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 that guy. <laughs> That's a foreign guy, whereas this these revelations are in pure Arabic, which, right. one, the Quran is not pure Arabic, but two, right. notice Allah, the great God, assumes that there's no such thing as translation. It, 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 right. Nothing can be translated from one language to another. This would be like me. I mean, imagine Dostoevsky puts out uh, crime and punishment, and then I come out right. with, and I go copy, I, I go write the, I go translate the entire thing into English. And put out my book and then people say ah you copied that story and i go what his story was in russian this was in england this is english there's no way i could have copied this story everyone right. every single person 100 percent out of 100 percent of people in the world would see that as the stupidest response they've ever heard ever including right. muslims muslims would say that right. is the dumbest defense of what you just did ever and yet, right. when Muhammad, here's a story from this guy sitting right beside him. 
then comes out with a revelation the next day, giving the exact same story. And they say, you're stealing it from that guy. His response is, no, he's a foreigner. I'm writing in pure Arabic. There's no way I could be getting this stuff from him. That's Allah's response. That is Allah's defense of Muhammad. And for some reason, when we when 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 we get to that, Muslims just turn off their ability to think critically and go, yeah, because right. again, if anyone else in the history of humanity used that defense, Muslims would immediately recognize it as a ridiculous defense. Somehow, right. when Allah says it, it's a slam dunk refutation yeah. of the of yeah. the point. And that's why I said, David, that the Quran possesses it contains the seeds of its own destruction mm-hmm. in Surah twenty five four to six. The, uh, it, it shows you that the gig is up. The the unbelievers have, are bringing this charge, and Muhammad's response is, "No, you're just lying. You're the liars. You're the fakers. Allah has sent this down." But you made a good point too, David. And let me just elaborate a little bit on the biblical definition of inspiration is not the same as the Quran, and this is where I think Muslims and Christians are talking past each other. And, I, and our Muslim friends equivocate when they say, "Well, what about the Bible?" Uh, the Bible uh, quotes these authors, Paul quotes these Greek uh, pagan philosophers and so forth. Well, the, the, the understanding of inspiration in the Bible is not that that it just came uh, slam dunk out of heaven, like God was downloading this mm-hmm. into people's brains. Um, and it's not a dictation uh, theory that God, is, that the angel Gabriel is dictating and people are just like automatons just writing down what they hear. In biblical inspiration, and the Holy Spirit sovereignly moves the biblical writers. So we're talking about a 1600 year period, not 23 years, but a 1600 year period, um, written by over 40 different authors in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And God moves them in such a way that he doesn't, he doesn't uh, 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 possess them, but he, he moves them in such a way that he keeps them from error, but he allows their, them to be free to use language and words that were familiar to the ancient Near Eastern customs. So, for example, when God told uh, Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with you, I'm going to make a brit in Hebrew. Brit means covenant. Well, the word brit was well known in, in the Semitic languages of, of Canaan and abroad. But there God sovereignly uses language, which, of course, he's sovereign over. He sovereignly uses words and terms that were familiar to Israel and its neighbors. And he moved them to communicate these words in their language so that they can understand their relationship with God. The Bible is given by God, but at the same time, he uses human instruments to write down. So, for example, David, if you look at Isaiah 2 and Micah 4, they're practically the same. Uh, And so Micah, no doubt, was a contemporary with Isaiah, and and, and I think Micah got it from Isaiah. Uh, And there's nothing wrong with that because the prophets shared their materials. But then you look at something like Psalm 29, for example, and you've got this wonderful psalm about the Lord uh, walking on the waters and the, the, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars and so forth. Well, we know that the Canaanites who worship Baal, there was a hymn to Baal that sounded exactly almost the same as that psalm there. And so what you find is the biblical writers are starting to use polemics. That is to say, what they're doing is they're using this language from the ancient Near East, and they're saying, you know, you know, when it thunders and there's lightning and there's rain, you guys think it's Baal. No, it's not Baal. It's actually Yahweh. Yahweh is the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He sends the rains and so forth. And so when we get to the New Testament, of course, Jesus quotes from the Torah. Paul quotes from the prophets. Uh, Jude even quotes from First Enoch. He doesn't call it scripture. But he quotes from a Jewish source that his hearers who were Jewish would understand. Paul quotes from Aratus of Sali in Acts 17, Epimenides. Mm-hmm. And he knows that he knows these sources because, of course, he, he was studied and so forth. But this is the difference, David, with, with biblical inspiration. God moves them along by the Holy Spirit, and they write down what he wants them to write. But he doesn't violate their humanity. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the Quran... Uh, according to the Hadith, what happens to Muhammad? He he falls into a trance. He starts shaking violently. He hears bells. He starts snorting like a donkey. They have to cover him. He gets all flushed. That is not how Paul received revelation. Moses didn't receive revelation by those means. And so, as you can see, the, the, I, the I, concept I, of... I think I saw something in the exorcist that sounded just like that. <laughs> Very much mm-hmm. so. 
and, and well, didn't Muhammad think he was possessed by the jinn? That was his, he had his first. That was his first. That was his first impression. Um, later, yeah. later, people who weren't there convinced him, no, he's a prophet. But his imp- exactly. his impression was that he was possessed, and then suicidal mm-hmm. as well. But isn't it interesting, Dave? He's in the cave by himself. Surah 96 is believed to be the first surah in chronological order. Uh, isn't it interesting? He's in the cave. There's no witnesses. It's just it's just Muhammad. And then this spirit being that grabs him by the throat and says, Ekra, Ekra, recite in the name of your Lord. But there's no witnesses, only Muhammad by himself. Compare that, for example, with the, the, the witnesses who saw the risen Jesus, the 500 at one time, James, the, the 11, Paul at last, and so forth, the women who saw him. And so the more we begin to dig deep into the comparisons between biblical inspiration and Quranic inspiration, they are my, they're galaxies apart. And that's why our Muslim friends, uh, when they try to impose this Islamic concept of inspiration on the Bible, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. And that is yet another argument against the inspiration of the Quran. It's affirming these early scriptures, which have completely different concepts of revelation in which make no sense, make no sense given the Islamic view of, of inspiration. Um, All right. Have uh, I have two sort of related questions here. Um, One is from just, an oak tree pick. Just an oak tree pick says, "How did Muhammad get a hold of Talmudic material, though?" So, in other words, how's Muhammad getting a hold of the Talmud? Uh, and, yeah. Oh, let, let me give you the related one here. Let me sure, put up. Sure. I can, I'm only going to put up one of these, but they're related. Uh, and then Mosawar uh, Barkze said, "How would the Quran copy the Bible if the Bible was not translated into Arabic?" Notice, uh, there, I'm, I'm guessing Mosawar here is a as a Muslim because he's got the same idea, <laughs> namely, you can't copy from one language to another, right? So the you would have had Christians who would have been multilingual in. 7th century Arabia. You would have had Jews right. who would be multilingual, people who spoke multiple languages, especially travelers, caravan traders, things like that. These guys spoke. Uh, it's, 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 more, it's more rare nowadays. But I mean, even now, if you go to, you, you go to Europe, you, you run into people and they speak three or four or five languages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that would have been pretty normal back then. But notice the assumption is no one can ever tell a story that could possibly be put into a different language. And so um, first, first the uh, first the question about the Talmud. Uh, so, how would Muhammad have got a hold of Talmudic material? Um, as, as far as I can tell, these these are just st- the stories that were included in the Talmud would have been circulated by the Jews of Muhammad's time, yep. and Muhammad's yep. talking to the Jews. He lives around the Jews. The the yep. the, 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 the I mean, the, the Muslim sources are filled with stories about him talking to the Jews, yep. and and they're they're having discussions. Somehow, how could Muhammad have known these stories? Yeah, I mean, he was in Medina. No, and uh, he befriended uh, a whole community of Jews there. Then later they were slaughtered because he claimed that they betrayed the, the treaty. But uh, while he was in Medina, uh, we know from Surah 2 that originally the Muslims faced Jerusalem when they prayed the Qibla was towards uh, Jerusalem. That, I'm giving you the historic interpretation of Surah 2. So why were they facing Jerusalem? Or well, many Muslim commentators believe that, Mus- that Muhammad was, was attempting to endear himself towards the, the Jews of Medina. And uh, where do you think he got his prohibition of pork from? Well, it was also from the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so after the Jews rejected him as a prophet, all of a sudden there's a new revelation. And the revelation now is, well, the Qibla, forget about Jerusalem. Now you have a new Qibla. Now you face uh, Mecca, which is the traditional interpretation, of course. Uh, So much so that when Muhammad uh, was relieving himself in the bathroom, uh, he would make sure that he was facing Jerusalem. Um, and it's illegal for a Muslim to, it's haram for a Muslim to uh, face uh, in the direction of Mecca while they're uh, relieving themselves. So Muhammad would have heard these from, from the Jews. Mm-hmm. This was a, a highly oral culture as well. And plagiarism isn't just, oh, you know, let me copy what David Wood just wrote here. That's not, uh, plagiarism is also stealing someone's words in, in speeches. And mm-hmm. so there are famous people who have given speeches where they've, They've copied from from another source. Mm-hmm. That's a form of plagiarism. Yep. And as you know, David, uh, being an academic yourself and, and, and gotten a, a doctorate yourself, you know that in universities and colleges that even using someone's idea without crediting mm-hmm. them in a, in a research paper, you're going to get dinged for plagiarism. So it's not just necessarily quoting word for word for word. Even borrowing someone's idea without crediting them is considered plagiarism. Yeah, that was actually something that came up uh, beforehand. People said, uh, how can it be plagiarism 
if Muhammad uh, couldn't read or write. Uh, let me just go ahead and look up. I, I'm, I, I, I'm scrolling down to this, and I'm going to oh. read whatever whatever uh, definition co uh, comes up. Uh, plagiarism, the first thing that pops up on the dic online dictionary here, the practice of taking someone else's work or ideas and passing them off as one's own. Right. Practice of taking someone else's work or ideas and passing them off as one's own. So notice, notice, ladies and gentlemen, that's why you clarify when you're quoting. That's why the biblical writers could quote things left and right. That's not that's not plagiarism. Saying, I just got this as a revelation from the great God Allah, and it's a story you just heard from this other guy, and then saying, Oh, but Allah says there's no way I could be copying that guy's story because he's a he 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 he, he you know he's a foreigner. That's a that's a ridiculous defense of plagiarism. And, All right, and I, I've 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 heard some doozies. I've heard some doozies uh, in my time. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, so so that's um, that's one, and then yep. um, again, this uh, I believe this is from a Muslim. How would the Quran copy the Bible if the Bible was not translated into Arabic? So yeah, you, you got you got the same thing here, right? You've got Christians; they're telling right. they're telling stories. Jews; they're telling stories. I mean, right. uh, Muslims. Keep in mind, Muhammad had a Coptic sex slave, right? Right. So th this was this is a, a this is an oral culture. That's what they did. They sat around telling stories, right? They sit down in a camp. There's no TV. There's no Netflix, right? They're not watching Netflix when they needed entertainment. They'd sit down. And tell stories. The Muslim sources are filled with this. Oh, by the way, uh, Tony, um, me and uh, mm -hmm. Anthony Rogers, we're, we're discussing how frequently in the Muslim sources, something that becomes part of Islamic doctrine was something that was just told to Muhammad by the Jews. Uh, for instance, the one, right. the one that came up in a, right. in a video uh, we were recording of Anthony is um, uh, the, the not swearing by anything other than Allah. Exactly right. Muhammad used and his followers used to swear by other things. So they used to say, you know, I swear by the Kaaba, things like that. It was some Jews who told Muhammad, hey, you know that when you're swearing by that, you're you're ascribing to it the same sort of power to be a witness and power to enforce what you've said that you would you would ascribe to God. So you're you're actually associating it as a partner with God. And then Muhammad comes out, ah, everyone. We must never swear by anything other than the great God Allah. And so this is right. notice it's it's over and over and over again it's Jews coming up to Muhammad correcting his theology and correcting his practice and yet we're we're at, <laughs> and it would have been the it would have been more common with Jews because there are more Jews around uh, around right. Muhammad in in Medina but you find the same thing with with Christians and yet the question comes up how could Muhammad be copying from that notice it's the same it's the same idea that we find in the Quran. There's no way you could get that story from this guy sitting beside you and anything could be translated or anyone could share a story. If you can't read, you're completely immune to all other sources right. of information and you could never be influenced by anything. It's absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And I believe it was one of the one of the caliphs, I think it was Umar, some of his words even got into the Quran. Mm -hmm. Some of his ideas that, uh, that he came up with, Muhammad liked them and actually got into the Quran. Uh, and so, it, again, it comes back to Surah 25, verses 46, where the Quran claims that all of its contents have been sent down. But what we're finding is that some Jew in Medina corrected Muhammad's theology, and all of a sudden, it becomes part of Islamic revelation. So I think that the Achilles heel of the Quran is the Quran itself. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly Surah 25, 46. Mm -hmm. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abi Sar as well uh, was one of Muhammad yeah. was one of Muhammad's was one of Muhammad's original scribes. Secretaries, yeah. yeah, was one of Muhammad. So this is guys. Th this is one of the guys who would when Muhammad uh, is reciting his revelation. Abdullah ibn Abi Sar was one of the people who was Muhammad's scribe. He would sit down and write it down. So they had it in written form. So he's one of the guys who's writing it on leaves or on uh, flat stones or on uh, shoulder blades from animals and so on. He's one of these guys who's copying it down. This guy later apostatized when it was asked him, why did you leave Islam? How could you leave Islam? It's because Muhammad would be rec reciting a revelation. And I would say it would be better to put it this way. And he would say, yeah, put it like that. And he would say something, and I would blurt something out, and he would say, yeah, that sounds good. Put that in there. He says, there's no way this guy's receiving this from God, because otherwise I'm correcting God. There's no way. 
And that's what you find. Exactly. That's what you find if you read the Muslim sources, Muslims, and that's why your leaders never, ever, ever want you reading the Muslim sources. That's why they just want mm -hmm. you listening to them. Fortunately for you, David Wood and Tony Costa are here to tell you what your leaders will never, ever, ever tell you. All right, a couple, uh, couple of super chats and uh, stuff here. So Frank Christian said, uh, David Wood uh, and Jesus loves you. Yep, thank you. Um, Spotlight official said, hope it helps, God bless. Yes, everything, everything else. Uh, in fact, Tony, Tony, once you get, uh, once you, once you get revved up with some top notch internet, we're going to get you, we're going to get you some top notch equipment. So right. we'll figure out what you need, but basically you, Anthony Rogers, we want everyone totally set up with an awesome setup so that when we go Basically, so that when you know uh, some 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 combination of us are going live all the time, yeah, then uh, then it'll it'll be cool, yeah. So yes, ladies, awesome. yes, ladies and gentlemen, everything helps because we're gonna do cool stuff. From JoJo Momster, we have a uh, a goal. I still to this to this day, I've never looked at the uh, possible uh, super stickers, but I've seen like probably I don't know thirty or forty different super stickers or something like that. Um, and Lance Johnson says, "God bless you always," and I hope the Muslims receive the love of. Yeshua. Yes, we do as well. And we hope and and notice notice Lance and everyone else who's watching, we can for for some reason you get you get down to our generation. Our generation is the one that thinks if you tell Muslims the truth about their religion, you tell them the truth about their prophet, you correct all their errors. And usually it's just by stating facts. If you do mm -hmm. that, you're mean and hateful. And the the loving approach is to just you know reinforce that their the 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 lies and myths they've been taught. And if you're doing anything other than that in our culture, then you're a big big meanie. Fortunately, that is that is not the case. Tony, why do you do what you do? I do what I do mm -hmm. because first and foremost, I love God. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, I love people. I love people. They're image bearers of God, and uh, they need to hear the gospel. Christ came into the world to save sinners, and uh, I love my Muslim friends. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I continue to reach out to them. I will engage in debates and dialogue. And I think something really important we have to point out here, Dave, is that we are not against Muslims. We do not hate Muslims. Mm -hmm. We love you for the sake of Christ. Yep. What we do not like is the ideology, the mm -hmm. worldview of Islam. And so ideologies don't mm -hmm. have feelings. Worldviews don't have feelings. They don't have rights. People have rights. And so we're not here to to attack Muslims. To to uh, we're not here to tear you down. If we tear you down with truth, it's because we love you. And Jesus Christ was the most loving person who ever lived. And yet they killed him. Why did they kill him? Because he told them the truth. He spoke the truth. Mm -hmm. And speaking the truth will get you killed sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so we're now in an age where where truth is now the new hate speech. That's what's happening yep. today. If we speak the truth, we're going to be called hate mongers, Islamophobes, we're going to be called every name under the book. Mm -hmm. But I want our Muslim friends to really understand this. Uh, David and I could be doing something much better than, than getting online or, or getting involved, involved in this type of ministry. We do this day in and day out. We've been doing this for many, many years because we love you and we want to see your lives changed just like Jesus Christ has changed our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something, something that we've seen over and over and over again is you can take any topic, uh, especially when it when it relates to Islam. You could take any topic. Mm -hmm. um, take take the preservation of the Quran, and if you're a Muslim apologist or a Muslim scholar, you can run around telling people the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad, and you can say that even though it contradicts everything we know about the Quran. You go to the Muslim sources, they talk about entire chapters coming up missing, large passages coming up missing. Muhammad's own, uh, his, his own reciters of the Quran couldn't even, after his death, couldn't even agree on which chapters were supposed to be in the Quran um, versus being eaten by a sheep that are lo no longer in the Quran today. Um, mm -hmm. You find, th that's what you find if you look in the Muslim sources when they talk about the preservation of the Quran. And of course you get to Uthman burning all copies of the Quran to cover up all the differences. Um, and then, of course, if you look at the manuscript tradition, you find you find the same thing. Even though the manuscripts are later, you still find all kinds of differences and so on. Certainly, certainly not one iota of evidence anywhere of perfect preservation. You would have so much evidence to explain away. I mean, matter of fact, let me put it like this. If the Quran 
if the Quran has been perfectly preserved, then it's just it's it's the greatest miracle of Islam because it has all the characteristics of a book that's been changed over and over and over again. So the miracle would be here's a book that has all of the characteristics of a book that's been repeatedly changed. And yet, if you say somehow this means it's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter, that would be a miracle only. Uh, well, I, don't, I mean, I don't know how God could perform it. It would entail a contradiction. Um, but uh, so you you take you take an issue like that, right? The Muslim preacher looks at the crowd of Muslims and says, it's a miracle of Islam that there has not been a change to one letter, one diacritical mark, nothing from the time it was revealed to Muhammad. Perfect preservation right down to the letter from the time it was revealed to Muhammad. We're looking at that. We know it's in the sources. We know that's a lie. But if we then sit down with a Muslim and say, hey, your Quran actually hasn't been perfectly preserved, that guy's lying to you, or he's just ignorant too, but look at all, look at what your own sources say, or look at these different manuscripts. And the response is, how dare you? You're, you're, you're spreading hatred towards us. You're, you're trying to get us, you're, you're calling for our deaths. You're a bigot. You're a, you're a racist. You're an Islamophobe. And in Islam, and not just, not just Muslims, but, it, but especially in, in our culture, Islam has done this. It's just completely inverted <laughs> morality yeah. to where lying, lying means that you love someone and telling them the truth means you hate them mm. and I, guys if that were if that were all i knew about your religion if that muslims if that were all i knew about your religion was that it encouraged you to view lying as good and loving and uh telling the truth as evil and hateful that would be enough to say this this there's no way this comes from god there's no way a religion does this and comes from god all right all right well uh we'll stay on for a couple more minutes hey check this out <laughs> <laughs> against heresies, against heresies, said Farid made a rather awful response to your disgusting facts about Muhammad. Will you be making a response video, David? Um, probably, probably, probably not until he gets a little more popular, right? Because keep in mind, when you say so-and-so made a response to you, David, guess what? People are making responses to my stuff every single day, right? You kind of have to, you kind of have to pick and choose. And I normally, I normally focus on going after Muhammad, going after Muhammad, going after the Muslim sources, going after the Quran. If I'm going to respond to a, to a person, it's usually Zakir Naik or Yasser Qadi, someone who's, someone who's very popular. Um, just because, you know, if you have to dedicate a certain amount of time, it's good to dedicate a certain amount of time to someone who has a, a large following. So um, yeah, let, let uh, Farid get a bigger following and, and that'll happen. If he, if he keeps going after all of us and we're not responding, Muslims will think, oh, he has great responses, but um, I didn't even, I, it, had, it had been pointed out that he'd made a response to me. Um, I, I, I didn't think he'd respond to the disgusting facts about Muhammad. That's actually cool because I actually asked for responses. So I'll, I might at some point have to check that out because I don't think they can defend the, the Muhammad being covered with semen, right? I, didn't, I don't think they can actually, but, but guys, keep in mind... Uh, <laughs> You got to you, always be thinking uh, ahead, two steps, three steps ahead of other people, right? These guys don't seem to understand, right? When I make a video called Top 5 Most Disgusting Facts About Muhammad, and then I challenge Muslims, let's see if you can defend this point, right? When I do that, if they take that bait and actually respond, I really don't care what they, I really don't care what they say. My goal was to get them to address the issue, right? Because here's the thing. Uh, and Tony, you've, you've seen this mm -hmm. years ago, years ago, if you're talking like in the nineties, I noticed, uh, before I started debating, I noticed when I looked up Christian Muslim debates, they were almost universally on Christian topics. Right. And the reason was the Muslims didn't want to debate Muslim topics because they didn't want the Muslim audience hearing about criticisms right. of Islam. And yeah. then, so that, that's, that's sort of changed in our time. We've actually seen more and more debates on, I mean, I think I've debated whether Muhammad's a prophet like seven or eight times now. So mm -hmm. that's shifted, but it was because, you know, we're doing the shifting. We're insisting, Hey, we need some, we need some Islamic topics, but here, right. yeah, but, but here, here's the same kind of issue, right? When I bring up an issue like Muhammad being covered in semen, I know that your average Muslim has never heard this before, right? They're not hearing that at the mosque. They're not hearing that from their parents. They're not hearing this from anybody. They never heard that their, their prophet was walking around covered in semen. They've never heard this, right? So I post it in my video, right? Now think about this, everyone. I post this in my video, but I know that even though there are Muslims who watch my videos, there are lots of Muslims who don't watch my videos. There are Muslims who watch other, watch Muslim channels, but not mine. They won't, they won't want to get information from me. So 
if I can get some some Muslim apologist to try to respond to the issue of Muhammad being covered in semen, and he addresses the issue and quotes the sources about Muhammad being covered in semen, guess what? I don't care if he offers some defense. I don't care if he says, aha, let me give you my brilliant reason why our prophet, unlike every other prophet in history and every other decently hygienic human being in history, was not. Let me tell you why he was covered in semen. Um, I, I don't care if you if you offer some great defense. Uh, more, more, more power to you. I'm more interested in the fact that your listener just heard that for the first time from you. So that's why we do these things. That's why we issue the challenges, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if someone gives a good defense, I, I something like that, I'd be happy to interact because I'm interested in seeing whether they can do that. But just so you know, if they even respond, then information that was previously not in the heads of this man's followers are now in the heads of that man's followers. And that, that is step one in getting them out of Islam. Once you, once you get enough information with the help of their apologists and their scholars, once you get that information into their heads, Eventually, they're going to realize, oh, gosh, what? I got a prophet who's walking around covered in semen. And then you, of course, pile on all the other stuff. Wow, that's awesome stuff. All right. Sorry I took so long on that, Tony. But uh, that's right. Get off your chest. <laughs> it does crack me up. I love it. It, it does crack me up that there are, because there's a Muslim in there saying, ah, he posted a response. He posted a response. He posted a response as if. I mean, gosh, again, Muslims post responses to my stuff all day, every yeah. day. So, all right. Um, on the issue of plagiarism, on the issue of plagiarism, um, we've kind of, uh, we've kind of already, uh, I've kind of already been through this, but, uh, um, as far as conclusions to draw from Muhammad's plagiarism, do you think that would be enough do you think that would be enough to I'm trying to think of trying to think of how much of a problem something needs to be to exclude someone as a as a prophet or uh, I'm inclined to think, yeah, this would be a problem for Islam that could potentially be outweighed by other evidence. Like if you had this problem, Muhammad seems to be copying from all these sources that seem to have nothing to do with uh, with anything historical. Um but that if there were some sort of other great evidence that outweighed that, then maybe you know maybe we could let that slide. But that in Islam, there's just nothing. It's all problems. You never get to anything that actually looks like evidence. So uh, how, how much of a problem do you think the plagiarism taken by itself is for Islam? Well, I think that uh, it's, I think it's been said that Islam is like a three legged stool and Islam rests on three three legs, uh, the prophet, the Quran and Allah. And if you show any one of those to be false or to be um, deficient, then you've lost one of the one of those legs. And a, a stool without a three-legged stool without one of its legs cannot cannot function. And so I think that by demonstrating that the Quran is not what it pretends to be, it's not what Muhammad claimed to be. The fact that it claims to be directly sent down Tamzil from Allah that it is eternal, and Anthony uh, Rogers addressed this with you, that it's the eternal word of Allah that was sent down. The fact that we can demonstrate from the Quran itself that the Quran, in fact, does come from earthly sources and bad ones at that, and, and that it cannot differentiate between something that is considered canonical and non-canonical. What does that say about Muhammad as a prophet? And then what does that say about the God who revealed these things. And so these three things, David, are all interconnected. One goes, the whole thing goes. So if you can demonstrate Allah is a false God, then Muhammad's a false prophet, the Quran's a false book. If you can show Muhammad's a false prophet, then that means his book is a false book, and the God who spoke to him is not the God of truth. Uh, and so I think that the ramifications for this, David, is it's, it's massive. Uh, and therefore, the Quran, if it is not the Word of God, then what is the Word of God? Well, the, the books that it points to, the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil, what we call the Holy Bible, that is the Word of God, and that is what we keep pointing back to. So if you've got a false book, folks, then that means that the one who revealed its contents cannot be the God of truth, it cannot be the God of Jesus, the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's similar to uh, sort of Nabil's reasoning uh, back when he was um, yeah. examining Christianity and Islam. He said he he basically realized that 
that Christianity, as far as evidence-wise, rests on Jesus' uh, death, resurrection, and claims to deity. And so right. he basically said Christianity has to be able to defend those three things. And so uh, he spent years looking into those three things, uh, Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and his divine nature. Um, but he said he, he realized that, that Islam uh, hinges on two. And if you could give a good defense for either one, then you'd be on pretty good ground. Uh, mm -hmm. Muhammad, you need a, an awesome defense of Muhammad or you need an awesome defense of the Quran. And what's interesting is just you, you look at the defenses of the Quran and you look at the defenses of Muhammad and they're all based on nonsense, right? I mean, yeah. the more you, if you take the claims that Christianity is based on, that Jesus died for sins, that he rose mm -hmm. from the dead, that he claimed to be Lord, you look at those, the more you study them, the more you, the more, the more evidence you find, right. right? The more evidence you find, the more you look at them. The arguments that are used to show that the Quran is the word of God and that Muhammad was a true prophet, the more you look at them, you, the more you realize it's, it's all nonsense, right? So, right. and, and the, the, lots of times it doesn't take, it doesn't take very long, right? If, if a Muslim would spend 10 minutes, I mean, every, like 99.999% of Muslims you will ever meet will tell you the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. Mm -hmm. If any of the, if those Muslims would do 10 minutes of research, they would realize that's complete nonsense. Um, and it's the same thing with Muhammad. Oh, because he had this great moral character. It's like, gosh, if you read about this guy's life, yeah. no one living in the West would want this guy living, living next door to them. No, it, um, not Muslims. Muslims would not want Muhammad living next door to you if you actually knew what a weirdo this guy was. So, yeah, that's just that's just what we find. It's uh, you look at the evidence for Christianity; it just gets better and better and better. The more you the more you study it, the evidence for Islam it evaporates instantly upon the slightest bit of research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting, David. When I when I you're absolutely right. When I first started debating Muslims, they always wanted to debate the Trinity: uh, is Jesus God? Which is a trick question. I I think that debating is Jesus God. It should be phrased. Is Jesus the God man? Mm -hmm. Because we don't believe Jesus only had one nature. Mm -hmm. We believe that he had two natures. And so to say he was he was only God is 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 a half truth. And so uh, they would want to debate is Jesus God? Is the Bible the Word of God? And so forth. And I had to literally uh, almost come to the point of pulling teeth with Muslim debaters to debate the Quran. Um, and they they wanted to check the materials we were handing out at the book tables and so forth. So you're absolutely right. They put the Christian always on the defensive, always, as if the Christian had to prove himself. And they actually thought that the Quran won by default. And that's that, of course, is fallacious. The Quran doesn't win by default. It has to be judged mm -hmm. in its own terms. And so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that at least our Muslim friends are willing to come out and debate issues like Muhammad and is the Quran the word of God and so forth. Um, and, and is Allah the, the, the same God that Jesus Christ worshiped and so forth. So uh, I, I, I have to say that when we first got started, when I got started way back in 92, 1992, that's what happened. Uh, it was always on Christian topics, mm -hmm. always on Christian topics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and by the way, that was brilliant. That was brilliant, right? That's a brilliant move, right? And you, you saw yeah. this in, in Shabir's early debates and everyone's, uh, you yeah. know, all the earlier debates. It would, uh, it would, uh, the Muslim would be attacking the the Bible or the crucifixion right. or something. The entire debate, and then the right. and then the Muslim would speak last and he would say, "So you see all these problems now? Convert yep. to Islam. That's why you yep. all need Islam." Yep. And yep. so basically, what they were doing was, Dave, think of it this way: they. They came on the stage with a, a, a pack of matches. They lit them and threw them on the ground, and the Christian is too busy trying to put out the fire. And so they always had us in the defensive stance. Um, so that that and that was the modus operandi as well of, of Ahmadidat. Mm -hmm. It was always crucifixion or crucifixion and and these types of silly debates. And and if you notice, they would debate uh, weak you know people like Jimmy Swaggart, who's not a theologian, who's a pastor, not a theologian. And so they would prey upon uh, usually pastors who were zealous for their faith, but they didn't have the head knowledge uh, to defend themselves against uh, the Islamic claims. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, can't help it. Can't help it. Diva girl love. <laughs> oh, she's in. She's back. She said, if the Quran was changed, then you will find many recitation and conflicts, but that's not the case. Allah <laughs> is great to preserve his scripture. So we can actually put this uh, in, uh, in, the form of in the form of a syllogism. 
If the Quran is changed, then you would find many conflicts in recitation. Um, premise two, you don't find many conflicts in recitation. Conclusion, therefore, what? Um, the, the Quran yeah. has been perfectly preserved. Yeah. Uh, Diva girl, love, you, you seem to ignore what we've been talking about. Uthman, the third of the rightly guided caliphs, gathered all of the Qurans specifically because they had differences in their recitation. That's not me. That's Sahih al-Bukhari saying, saying yeah. this, right? When we say the entire right. chapters of the Quran came up missing, that's not me. That's Muhammad's companion Abu Musa and Sahih Muslim warning people not to harden their hearts and stop reciting as he and his companion, he and the other companions of Muhammad did, and forgot and two entire chapters of the Quran. So this is your own sources saying that entire chapters of the Quran came up missing, yeah. saying that there were so many differences in the recitations that they had to burn all copies of the Quran. And here, you, you once again, I, I, I think it's great, Diva Girl Love, that you are used by God in this way. To, yeah. to constantly show all the people who are watching what Islam can do to a person's mind, to where we could put the we could put the passages up on the screen, showing Uthman saying we have to do something about all these differences in our recitation. We can we need to burn all the evidence, and how you will come along right after that. Hey, if the if the Quran if there were if the Quran had been changed, then there would be differences in the recitation. But that's not what we have. And you just and somehow somehow you just won't get it. No matter what happens, face it, we could put a thousand sources up on the screen. We could put a thousand manuscripts up on the screen showing you all the differences and you would still say perfect preservation right down to the letter. And if we think about why, why you didn't get that from your God, you didn't get that from Muhammad, you didn't get that from Muhammad's mm -hmm. companions, you weren't shown that evidence, you just heard it. it what Islam is great at doing, it's great at taking people indoctrinating them all their lives so that any resistance to anything that your imam or your parents, any sort of resistance is just crushed until you are a complete just drone for what they tell you. And if nothing else gets accomplished here, we are thankful that you help people understand that. With that said, we will continue dealing with your objections because Keep in mind, I, I've met, I, I've known plenty of Muslims who seem stubborn for years and years and years and years and years, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they come to Christ. I was, I was stubborn when I was, when I wasn't a Christian. Uh, I'm still stubborn now, but in a, in a different way. <laughs> all right, Tony, we should probably be wrapping up now. Yeah, um, let me just say that uh, I think Diva Girl's uh, second premise. She, uh, I mean, she just demonstrated it's an invalid argument. It's not only invalid; it's unsound. And so the argument breaks apart. And, and in terms of recitation, I mean, uh, I think it's in Surah 1. Uh, the, some of the manuscripts say that Allah is the Lord, the Rab, the Lord of the worlds. And the other one calls him the king, the Malak. And so there you have a scribe, there you have a textual variant. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you're right. Uthman said that the Quran was being recited differently and therefore he had to standardize it. So mm -hmm. the Islamic sources are there, Diva Girl. You just got to look for them. We didn't write them. They were written long before you and us even came around, so they're there. Yeah, uh, but but keep in mind, Tony, keep in mind the modern Islam. Oh, and actually, here's a good one from uh, Islam Critique. Yeah, Islam Critique said, Diva Girl Love, watch my latest video, Nothing But Conflicts and Destruction in the Early History of the Quran. Uh, yeah, and I'm going to be reposting that on, on my channel, but everyone, uh, if you're not subscribed to Islam Critique, uh, definitely subscribe to that channel. Um, uh, Tony, post videos um, on the channel The Third Degree, and the link to that is in the description box. Also, you're having a uh, you're having a uh, fairly in-depth two-month course coming up, uh, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, um, it's going to be an eight-week course. It's going to run on Sunday afternoons from 2 p.m. till 4.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, and that's also in the description box. I'll be teaching a course on how to read the Bible. And uh, it is being offered, obviously, in class, but also online. So those of you who are online and would like to take a seminary level uh, course on uh, the Bible, it is available in the description box. You could um, you could register online. It's $100 uh, for those uh, online students. You now, get the uh, now when PowerPoints. You, when, you say yeah. when you say $100, you're in Canada, yeah. right? So Canadian, you mean Canadian so dollars. So that's like 50, Canadian that's dollars. Like 50 cents or something. <laughs> yeah. It's Monopoly money. So, yeah, 
So you're absolutely right, David. So it's a, it's a deal actually for those in the U.S. because I guess you're paying what eighty bucks or something. So it's a seven-year level course. It's it it runs for uh, eight Sundays. We get Easter Sunday off, and it's from two to four thirty. We use Zoom uh, instead of Skype, so we use the Zoom program, and uh, people get uh, it's a live class. They get PowerPoint. They get handouts. So um, yeah, so all the information is on the description box. And thanks for posting that, David. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't help myself. Diva Girl Love said, but the proof can be tested of Quran today right now. Diva Girl Love, there are, what, how, how many Qurans has, uh, has, uh, Hatun put together something like 32 by now or something? Yeah. yeah. Diva Girl Love, these are, uh, Hatun Tash has, has something now like 32 Qurans that she's bought by going around the world to different places where they use, and these are not different translations. These are Arabic Qurans that are all different from the Quran that you have in Arabic. In other words, if you have an Arabic Quran, uh, there are something like at least 31 different Arabic Qurans that have different words with different meanings than what you have. What's amazing is Hatun and Jay have put out entire videos where they, they put the Arabic side by side no. showing different words. And somehow you'll, I don't, I don't... <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's it's like someone to say here here you know I'm gonna believe that you know four plus four is fifteen prove me wrong but I won't accept any evidence no matter how strong it is and uh, what do you do with someone like that well we can just hope that a light switch goes on at some point and you realize wait a minute if everything my leaders have been telling me all my life the second I investigate I investigate it turns out to be false maybe I need to stop trusting them. That, that's the light switch moment, Devo Girl Love. Because notice this should, this should be a light switch moment. As if nothing else that you that we've gone through, where pretty much everything you've ever said in the comment section turned out to be completely false, and and you get this information from your scholars and your apologists. This is a perfect example, right? You've heard all your life, amazing. There's no difference in any recitation of the Quran. Perfect preservation, right down to the letter. And we are telling you, look. Just go to Islam Critique's new video. He's got the sources up on the screen that talk about some of the things that we were just talking about. Uh, go to my video. Go to my video with Nabil Qureshi, a brief history of the Quran. We go through your sources. We show over and over again the missing chapters, all of these things. Uh, if you think that, well, now after Uthman burned all the Qurans, now it's perfect preservation right down to the letter. Since then, wrong, 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 wrong. Human beings are involved in copying the Quran and human beings make mistakes. And guess right. what? If you go to a place in Turkey that's using one version one version of the Quran and they're learning this recitation of the Quran from that version and you go to a place in Africa that's using a different version of the Quran and they're memorizing it from that, they will recite the Quran differently. You don't know it because you never bother to investigate it. What we're saying is this is this is what you should be thinking. Um, if, if you, if you want to, if you want to put this in argument form too, if my leaders are telling me the truth, then when I go to the evidence, I should find perfect preservation up. Oh, I go to the evidence. I don't find perfect preservation. I find the exact opposite. Therefore, I can't trust my leaders. You, everything we discuss on here with you should be proof that you cannot trust your leaders. And yet, no matter what they tell you, they could tell you, they could tell you four plus four is, is 15. And you just, it seems that you just believe them. And you, we could have 100 PhD mathematicians here sitting in front of you telling you, nope, breaking down what 4 plus 4 actually is. And you just wouldn't believe them because your 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 leaders told you something else. This is amazing. What, are, what Guys, does everyone see? Does everyone see what this religion does? Is this what the true religion does to people? Does it convince them to mindlessly obey falsehood, to look at falsehood as love, to look at truth as evil and deception? Is, is that what the true religion does? Or are these the marks of a very false and very dangerous ideology? And there's deception too, David. Remember Second uh, Corinthians chapter four, verses three to four. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to those who are lost. Who the God of this age has blinded the minds. Notice it's the mind blinded. Mm -hmm. that is blinded, not the eyes. It's the mind that is blinded, so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ will not shine in. So our prayer is that is that um, Diva Girl Love understands that the master of deception here, I mean, Allah's called the greatest of the schemers, but the master of deception here is Satan himself. And he will blind the mind, not your eyes. You could see 
-hmm. You can see with your visible eyes, but he will blind your mind so that you will not see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. So our prayer for you, Diva Girl, is this. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. The truth liberates, lies, captivate, lies, subjugate. The truth will set you free. And Jesus says, if you know the truth, you if you know the son, you will be free indeed. And so come home, Diva Girl, come home. I can't help it. <laughs> is there another one? Another one, David? Yeah, and, and, and again, the, the, the ones that I'll do at the end of the show when I'm planning to log off, it's kind of just if if it looks like something else that, that might answer some other Muslim's uh, objection. <laughs> uh, notice, Diva Girl Love said, how many, how many books are there in the Bible? 66 or 73 books are, <laughs> are missing here. So, oh, boy. So notice. Yeah. Notice. Uh, by the way, Tony, what, what's the idea behind um, 66 books or 73 books that's being posted, well, which, the, the, which, which Diva Girl Love uh, doesn't know what she's talking about? But look that yeah. up and, and put that there. But what's the basis for that? Yeah, the basis for that is that uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church accepted seven books. Um, that's why there's 73. Seven books uh, that we call the Apocrypha. Now, a lot of that had to do with the idea that in early Christians uh, would use these books as devotional books, books like First and Second Maccabees, uh, the Book of Tobit, uh, the Book of Wisdom, and so forth. And, and some of them were inclined to believe later uh, that these books were inspired. And so uh, over the course of history, the Roman Catholic Church declared these books to be part of Scripture at the Council of Trent in 1546. Wait, wait no, I, want you to, I want you to repeat that, right? So yeah, so the Roman when, yeah. when, so diva girl love. So 1546. That's when these additional books are uh, declared part of the Christian canon, and it's because they need to defend some doctrines that they couldn't exactly defend very well with with against the, the reformers. The That's right. And so the reformers uh, they reason this way: if the Jews don't know their own Bible, then nobody does. And so the reformers look to the Jewish canon, which only has 20, uh, excuse me, it has 39 books. That is the Old Testament. And uh, we know that the early church fathers like Athanasius and, and Jerome, who was a, a Latin father who translated Hebrew into Latin, Jerome rejected these other books as well. And so you need to understand that the Jews hold to the 39 books of the Old Testament. Christians hold to 27 as well in the New for a grand total of 66. Mm -hmm. The Roman Catholic Church accepted these other books. They call them deuterocanonical. So they even admit these other books are not protocanonical. Mm -hmm. They have a secondary status. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, the Roman Catholics would grant the argument that the Protestants and the, and the Jews hold to the protocanonical, the books that were contained, or as they put it, it was laid up in the temple. These were word, the books that were inspired. They defiled the hands. That means they made the hands unclean because they were so holy. But these other books were not accepted until uh, 1546 at the Council of Trent and mainly for polemical reasons against the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. All right. And here's why I wanted to bring this up, right? Because when you notice Diva Girl Love, you'll look at some you'll look at some uh, Muslim website and it'll say, ah, you see, the Bible's been corrupt. Some Bibles have 66 books, while others have 73. This is proof that Christians can't even get their minds straight. And if you look into it, now, we, the books that Jews have of the Old Testament, that's the books that we have. Christians have the same books of the New Testament. But at some point, 15 centuries after the time of Christ, in response to the Reformation, um, some Catholic leaders who needed to defend certain doctrines, had, the other, had these other sources called Deuterocanonical and said, all right, we're, 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 we're going to start putting those in our Bible now because we need to, we need to have, those, have those in there. All right. So regardless, and for you Catholics watching, we're, we're, we're not even discussing whether, you know, whether that's a good idea or not like this. Obviously, Tony and I disagree. Not the point. The point is that's 15 centuries, 15 centuries after the time of Christ. Could anyone regard that as evidence of the corruption of our scriptures or the corruption mm -hmm. of our doctrine or something like that? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no. Mark didn't change. Matthew didn't change. Luke didn't change. None of that has changed. None of the books that we agree on has changed, right? So why am I bringing this up? Well, the differences, the differences, Diva Girl Love, come along 15 centuries after the time of Christ. That's where you get this difference in the Bible. But 
I invite you to do something you've never once done and your leaders definitely don't want you to do. Look at the early history of your Quran and yeah. Muhammad's top experts on the Quran, Muhammad's right. top reciters. Muhammad told his followers, if you want to learn the recitation of the Quran, learn it from four people. He named four people who were his best reciters of the Quran. Two of the people on that list were Ibn Masud. That was his mm -hmm. number one guy. He said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from that guy, Ibn Masud. And another, number four on the list was Ubay ibn Kab. So Muhammad says, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from these guys. And he names, he names four guys. One of those guys, the top guy, Muhammad's top reciter of the Quran. Guess how many chapters he had in his Quran, Diva Girl Love? Mm. He had 111 chapters. Open up your Quran today. How many chapters does your Quran today have? 114. Well, why? Why <laughs> did Ibn Masud have different chapters? Well, he believed that Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114 were not supposed to be in the Quran. He said, those are prayers. That's us talking to God, not God talking to us. Those, those, are, those are prayers that Muslims pray. They're not part of Allah's, Allah talking to us. What are you guys talking? It's not Allah, that's not Allah's eternal speech. That's us talking to Allah. Those are our prayers, right? So he said, those are, not, those are not part of the Quran. And guess what? That was Muhammad's number one guy. But guess what? It gets better because Ubay ibn Kab, who was another of Muhammad's top four reciters, he included those three chapters, the three prayers, but he also included two more. He included yeah. two more, two additional prayers. So Ubay ibn Kab had 116 chapters in his Quran. He had two chapters that are not in your Quran. Why am I pointing all of this out, Diva Girl Love? Well, you said, how many books are there in the Bible? 60, 66 or 73 books? Something, something's missing here. Well, Diva Girl Love, we showed you that that difference arose 15 centuries after the time of Christ. You can't say something happened 15 centuries after the time of Christ, and therefore it somehow affects our view of, of the Bible. That would be like me adding another book to the Quran right now and saying, aha, you've got a problem here. But when we talk about the Quran, it's the first generation. It's the first original generation of Muslims who could not agree on which chapters are supposed to go in the Quran. So tell me. Does the Quran say does the Quran have 111 chapters or 114 or 116? Because I can go to the first mm -hmm. I can go to the first generation of Muslims and get any one of those answers, right? And you obviously would say 114 because that's what your leaders have taught you. That's what your leaders have taught you to say. But guess what? By saying that, they're saying that your prophet's wrong because your prophet said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from that guy, Ibn Masud. Well, Ibn Masud said your chapter, your Quran today has three extra chapters. What are you doing? So do you see, <laughs> Diva Girl Love, you're taught by your apologists on these horrible, horrible websites you go to and these dumb, stupid videos you go to. Ha, Christians have a problem, a problem that's not hard to answer at all. But if you took the problem seriously for five seconds, you should be asking yourself, wait a minute, the problem that I said Christians have, they don't actually have, but we do have it in Islam. And none of my leaders ever tell me this. Why do your leaders never tell you about the history of the Quran, the manuscript differences, the missing chapters, the differences among Muhammad's own experts? Why don't they tell you this? Because they want you above all else to remain in a state of ignorance that you're in so that you won't leave Islam. And the amazing thing is that when we come along and we tell you the information that's in your own sources, when we tell you the things that your own prophet said, you look at us and say, wow, these guys are such, they're so hateful. How could they do this to me? How could they be such bigots telling me what my prophet said? Why can't they lie to me like my leaders? Amazing religion. Thank you for helping us <laughs> expose it. Yeah. Now, now, Anthony, I'm not even going to scroll down because I know Diva Girl Love is going to say something else and that I, I know I'm going to love to answer it, but I just I just can't. I just can't. <laughs> well, you know, Dave, one of the earmarks of truth is that truth is always consistent. Yep. And so it's interesting, isn't it, that we're open about our history. We're willing to look at the manuscripts of the Bible. We're willing to look at, we just talked about the Apocrypha being added in 1546. Yeah. We're willing to look back and say, yeah, the, this this happened. And yeah, there, there, there are these textual variants in the manuscript tradition. 
we're willing to be consistent with the evidence. And when you have to suppress that that history, it's no different than what the Mormons do with the Book of Mormon, where they don't want you to look at the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon because it is it is packed full, chock full of errors and mistakes and so forth. And then there's 3,900 changes that they added to the text in the later versions of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. So when we try to suppress the past and, and try to suppress the truth, um, that is a that is a, 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 a tell a tall sign that we, we we really need to examine whether or not our beliefs are are in accordance with truth. I mean, Socrates once said that the unexamined life is not worth living, and I think the unexamined faith is not worth believing. If your faith can't stand up to scrutiny, uh, diva girl, then what does that say? Um, Christianity mm -hmm. has been attacked for two thousand years, and the Bible's been attacked, and it's still, it has withstood the test of time, uh, because uh, truth lasts. Truth is eternal. So, yeah, I think consistency is so important here, David. Uh, our Muslim friends are always using, uh, you know, James White talks about these uneven scales. Mm -hmm. They have one set of rules for the Quran that they will not apply to the Bible. So, again, inconsistency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as James White points out, inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument. Sign of argument. a failed argument. Sign of a That's failed right. argument. And uh, right. yeah, we, we've, we've, uh, we've pointed out many times in the past, Diva Girl Love, you can walk into any Christian bookstore and find mm -hmm. Christians discussing textual variants and things like that, right? You can go into any Christian bookstore and you find those kinds of things. Why? We're honest about the evidence. We discuss the actual evidence. When people have, when there's, when there are issues with the evidence, we bring them to the surface and talk about them. Right. The solution that you have in Islam is the same as it was during the time of Uthman. Burn it all, destroy it all, cover it up. That way no yeah. one ever has to think about it. And the result after 14 centuries of this is uh, it's people like you who just can't even can't even uh, comprehend anything apart from what you've been told to believe. Uh, you've been it's been concealed from it's been you, you're kept from it. You're kept from basic facts about your own religion. You're kept from basic facts about our religion. Um, we're glad that we have the power of the Internet now where you continue to be drawn to us either to help us expose your own uh, beliefs or um, or to eventually pay attention. Uh, so we hope that you're actually being drawn by the spirit so that you actually come to the light. And wow, what a story you're going to have later on, right? We can, we can go back through these discussions, take all your comments and show future generations. Look, look at the things I used to say. Look how silly these things were when I was in darkness. And now, now I'm in the light. All right. Well, uh, thanks to, uh, thanks to Tony Costa for joining me here again. Um, you can, uh, there's a link to, uh, Tony, uh, site that, uh, YouTube channel that Tony posts lots of videos for and, um, and to, ch uh, Tony's, um, uh, seminary level course that he'll be going through. If you've got some, those are Sundays, you said Sunday afternoons. Yeah. yeah. If you've got Sunday afternoons free and you want to spend two months of Sunday afternoons, actually digging in deep on how to read the Bible. Um, you've got the, you've got the link for that. All right. Well, um, I guess we will be catching you all here pretty soon. For, for, for by the way, for everyone who's asking me about my brother, um, it, uh, I'm 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 going to visit my brother tomorrow. So I, that's why I'm not responding. I'll have, I'll be able to give a much better update when I'm actually there. So expect a expect an update probably on Friday, video update. But I'll actually probably get some get some footage of of how he's doing. So, all right, Tony. Right, David. Thank you so much, brother. All right. Catch you all later. Diva Girl Love. You need to repent. <laughs> <laughs> See you all next time.